Thanks everybody for coming to our first Roper Center Speaker Series event in some time. My name is Jonathan Schultz and I'm the Interim Executive Director here at the Roper Center. Um, welcome to people in the room, but also people joining us online as well. Um, we're excited to welcome Israel Wisemel Manor back to campus. As many of you know, uh, Israel is a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Haifa where he co-directs the Political Behavior Lab. His work on public opinion, political communication, and political psychology has been widely published in places including Public Opinion Quarterly, Communication Research, uh, and American Behavioral Scientist. Israel is also a great citizen of the discipline. I have to give him credit for this. In his service, currently is editor of the Poll Trend section of POQ, among many other uh, efforts. It's wonderful to have him back today at his graduate alma mater. Please join me in welcoming Israel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope everything is, is okay with the mic. Uh, it's really exciting. I, I haven't been here like uh, ages. Um, I think there was a bush in the White House or something. It was uh, one of them was in the White House. I, I can't. Um, and thanks for uh, Brad and John and, and Peter for, for the extended this invitation. And I'm, I'm really happy uh, that I can be here. Um, now, this uh, project is, is not a, just something I did by myself. I would like, first of all, I would like for us to work. Um, if I turn it on, it probably may start working. Oh, good. Um, maybe. Um, on. Am I using my? Perhaps I'm using. No, it's not. It's not shifting at all. That's the thing. Um, perhaps because I'm I'm sharing the wrong screen. Are we sharing? Let's try and share the other screen. And it sure fun. All right. So hi, it works. Wonders. So this is a joint project with uh, some really uh, good friends and colleagues, Patricia Moy from uh, the University of Washington and Rico Newman from the University, Technical University of Berlin, and my in our grad student, because um, Patricia Moy and I are, are working with Moran, Moran Shechnik, who's doing a PhD at uh, Haifa University. And this is part of her dissertation, uh, at least the, the first project out of, of many other things she's gonna do for a dissertation on corruption. So uh, this project really started in my head uh, around almost 15 years ago, which is in, in our, span of academic work, it's, it seems like a lifetime, but uh, it started with, with a, a really strong motivation, and that was this guy. Uh, you may know this guy, um, and he recently has been connected to not so very interesting or good uh, deeds, and uh, is currently under a, a trial for a, um, uh, corruption for a uh, breach of trust and uh, and uh, other uh, uh, acts uh, related to many deals in which he uh, allegedly benefited uh, from deals that he was in charge of as prime minister or as minister. Uh, so Netanyahu was uh, fighting these charges for the last part of the more than ten years, um, and I had a big debate with a friend of mine who is the expert, I think the, the most prominent expert on corruption in Israel, and he cared deeply about the trial, about this, the money he allegedly stole and it's millions of dollars. And I said, I don't care about any of that. And he said, why not? And, he, and I told him, look, this is not the important thing. We have many corrupt politicians in Israel. For instance, Arya Derry. So obviously, for those of you who don't know, this is Benjamin Netanyahu, right? Uh, Arya Derry was our former minister of, of interior two times. That's the both times in which he was the minister of interior. He stole money and, uh, uh, for himself and his family. Uh, first time he served two years in jail. Now the second time he reached a deal and he just resigned from the Knesset, but he won't, he won't uh, serve time in jail. 
We have Prime Minister Olmert, who served six times, six years in jail for stealing money. Uh, and again, the stealing of the money was not a big issue. He was convicted of basically save, using the same receipts twice and getting money from different organizations. Uh, so it was only $50,000 in terms of what he gained, but it was much more, to my degree, this is not the issue. The issue for me and my beef with my friend is that I believe that corruption is much more damaging to the state than just the act of the corruption. Because this is, even if Netanyahu, the allegedly sums of money are $25 million. So that's peanuts for me and for the state. Because if people who watch these individuals on TV say, hey, everybody's stealing, or my leaders are stealing, I can perhaps steal myself, then we reach those proportions in which in Israel right now, we're talking about, uh, I think it's uh, nine, uh, 9 billion shekels a year in which people evade from paying taxes or, or working through the dark economy, the black economy. And, and that was the motivation for, for this study. I wanted to see whether corruption corrupts the individuals. And, and, and by the way, this is not just about money. It can lead to other studies about, for instance, whether you want to vote, for instance, or participate. If everybody's corrupt, if the system is corrupt, perhaps I shouldn't vote. Now, I want to make a difference between petty corruption and grand corruption. So grand corruption is what those politicians do. They actually take a, a public power and they misuse it and they get benefits. And it's not something that just happens, obviously, in Israel. It happens all across the world. Uh, you had, a, a, what was this name, a Bogdanovich, the, 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 the um, right, thank you. So he, he, tro he tried to sell the Senate seat for a million dollars. Um, but I'm more concerned about how that affects this. And this is actually quite prevalent in many places. The, the small petty corruptions that, that we have uh, are... Some countries have it more than others. Now, this could be in, in many uh, shapes or forms. So for instance, in South America, it's very common that if a police officer stops you for whatever, sometimes they stop you for nothing, uh, but they tell you, you ran a red light or you were driving the, beyond the speed limit, then you say, okay, there's a fine or there's, you have to go to the police station and you say, can I pay the fine here? <laughs> Okay, puedo pagar acá. If you say that, then it's common knowledge that, okay, you can get to an arrangement with the policeman of that. Uh, very common in Israel, in other countries, in Asia as well, is that to make sure that you get a good treatment, you bring presents, sometimes before the treatment, sometimes after the treatment to the doctor, especially if it's your caregiving physician and you are in a relationship with him. So you don't really know when it started and when it ends, but... Uh, Many people do that. So, for instance, my brother-in-law is a physician. He's a neurologist. Many people post-recovery post bring him alcohol for some reason, like whiskey, good whiskey, uh, as a thank you. But some people bring it before the operation or before the treatment. Um, store owners uh, may avoid taxes by just selling you stuff uh, without using credit cards and then paying with cash and then avoiding paying some taxes. And it's very common in many places, including Israel, in which taxi drivers who tell you, uh, let's not uh, operate the meter, let's just go with a fixed price. And actually, I think Patricia Moy is in the audience, and Patricia was in Israel last week, and last Saturday, she was driving a taxi, and this uh, driver told her that uh, he wants to give her a, fi a fixed price, and she said, no, I want the meter. And eventually, she had to go down from the taxi and say, I'm not driving with you. Stop shouting at me. I'm going off the, off the taxi because I don't want to pay a fixed price. So these things are very common and they cost the economy tons of money. Um, now, the assumption is in my, in my, in my study that the exposure to um, uh, corruption and the... Um, uh, through TV, mediated exposure, uh, is going to cause people to perhaps be more willing to act corruptly themselves. Uh, so we have cases from Spain to Malaysia to Canada to Israel to the United States, 
almost any country you can look out, you can find articles and stories about politicians. And many times uh, it's at the municipal level. Corruption is much higher when you go to the local politics level. So mayors, governors and such. Uh, but obviously it can go all the way to, to the top in terms of uh, corruption. Now, Israel would be a good case to study this, uh, uh, this thing because um, uh, we're not as bad as Syria in terms of corruption, uh, but we're kind of in the middle between what would be New Zealand and Denmark and Finland and Switzerland and, and, and uh, Sweden, uh, which are kind of on the top of the most clean countries in terms of corruption. And there are various ways to measure countries' corruption. One measure is by Transparency International, that they do a poll of experts on each country and businessmen and lawyers, and they try to get how bad this year was in comparison to previous years. So Israel is not that great, but there's a, a room to at least think that some people think that corruption is not a good thing, at least like perhaps in Syria or Sudan. Now, the, uh, the element of, a, of corruption, the assumption would be, and, and the research seems to suggest that the higher the, um, uh, the prize money for being corrupt, there's more likely that I'll be able to tempt you. So if I'm gonna ask you, each one of you right now, uh, for instance, would you, I don't know, help me break into the Cornell system Right. For one dollar, I guess most of you won't do it. But if I'll go high enough, maybe some person who has some IT knowledge would say, you know what, for that sum, yes. So the, uh, the study shows that usually when you let people in social psychology experiments cheat on something, so for small amounts, they won't do it. But if you give them like perhaps $10 or $15 to cheat, then suddenly the cheaters go up. And in some studies, I think Ariely has one study of, uh, of cheating, excluding himself on something that, that um, uh, gave a rough estimate of about 70% of people would cheat, okay, with the right amount. Okay? With the right amount, 70% of people would cheat. So our first assumption or first hypothesis would be that exposure to monetary incentives would bring you, uh, would make people more willing to act in an unethical way. Again, this is not corrupt. I'm not gonna, with $1, I won't be able to corrupt you. I will corrupt perhaps your soul, right? Uh, in a more kind of like a Catholic way, but, uh, or Jewish way, that's works both ways. But, um, but if I'm gonna give you some um, incentive, economic incentive, there's a chance that I'll be able to make you act in an unethical way something that will break or breach the, the contract of, of trust between us. Now, who are the cheaters? And that's people, especially the media are interested mostly in this. Tell me, tell me, is there a gene that predicts cheating? Is there a, a trait? People with beards, small mustaches, whatever. So <laughs> men are involved in corruption more than women. In general, men break the law more than women. Uh, we see more corruption in right-wing regimes than in left-wing regimes. Perhaps to some degree, it has to do with the, uh, the strength of ideology, which we're not sure, but perhaps because you're much, you care deeply about what you're trying to achieve, then you say the hell with the rules. The rules were established by the old regime, which was a leftist regime, many times happens in, in South America. So this is the regime of the left. Now we have to clean the stables, to clean the stables, it means we need to act corrupt to, to fight the corruption. Um, lower education, we have a more propensity to say that corruption is okay, especially if the corrupt person is working on my behalf. Uh, I was once heard this Argentinian uh, uh, interview. It would just, uh, um, I'm originally, I'm from Argentina, by the way. I was born in Argentina. I immigrated to, to Israel when I was eight. So I heard this person down on the street and he said, um, uh, uh, he said, roba, pero es mi leader. He steals, but he's my leader. 
So it steals for my causes. So if it's stealing for improving my things, then it's, it's okay. Finally, a more religious society is the higher the corruption, regardless of religious affiliation. And this in some studies of social psychology, they found that if you think there's a higher being that's gonna judge you in, in judgment day, you don't really care about the judgment day here, okay? And many of these religious societies are caste societies uh, in which you're allowed to cheat on behalf of your caste because you're helping your crowd and that's seen as okay. So for instance, uh, uh, if you admit somebody to your university, although he has an SAT score that's lower, but you're doing it for your caste, then it's okay. So out of this, we really don't know when it comes to Israel, but uh, because we, the first study was in Israel, to what extent do social demographics impact the willingness to engage in petty corruption? So we control for a bunch of, of variables. Finally, uh, and this is our, our the, the thing we are, we are, the holy grail we were after, uh, we assume that obviously by watching television, right, we are exposed to what's accepted behavior, unaccepted behavior. And uh, in addition, uh, we know that when people watch something on TV, for instance, suicides, the last thing you wanna do is have your kids watch another kid having committed suicide because it may prompt them to think uh, one way or the other. So uh, this goes to crime, this goes to murders, this goes to suicide. So there's no reason to believe that other unethical behaviors uh, would not be the same. But so we ask, can mediated exposure to corruption can lead people to engage in more uh, petty corruption? And now the problem is how do you detect people acting in, a, in an unethical way, okay? And over the last 20 years, there's been many improvements on, on this research. So first of all, a, one way, when there, I'm not gonna go over all the methods, I'm just gonna present a few. By the way, I, I, I never got a time on how much am I supposed to talk for? <laughs> Tell you're finished. <laughs> Lunch, so don't, you know, we have an hour at least. Okay, okay, so, okay. So um, one way would be uh, to measure time. So the assumption here is that when you're trying to lie something out, then it takes cognitive effort. Cognitive effort means that your responses are gonna be a bit slower, all right? If your wife just called you up and you're like with perhaps her best friend, then it's not gonna be like you're, you're, you're shopping. Or I'm, at, I'm at a PNC, I, I'm at, uh, where am I? I'm, I'm, okay, it's gonna take you some time, right? Um, it's recorded, right? So my wife will be able to see it later. <laughs> uh, so the response takes a bit longer. The problem is that uh, sometimes you are just slower for other reasons. You didn't understand the question. Perhaps it's not your native language. Perhaps it's unclear. Perhaps you were just thinking about you need to bring some dinner for, for home and you're just distracted. And another vein of research, uh, uh, Fischenbach and Fulomi Helsi and also Ariely are doing this a lot. Uh, they show that people who are dishonest tend to be luckier. So for instance, the famous experiment that they did in this study was that you are given a, die, a dice and, and a die and, and you have to throw it. If you get a six, you get zero money. If you throw any number from one to five, you get one to five dollars. And for some reason, I think that the one is about 6% of the distribution of the, of, the, of the throwing. And the number five was about 35 or 40% of the people throw a five, okay? Uh, but uh, here, unless you put a camera, and, uh, and on the person, you won't be able to know if that person was cheating, right? So the, the experiment is that you throw a dice on your, by yourself and you have to report to the um, a scholar, the, 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 the DRA, you have to tell them what you got in your die, but you don't have to show it. And therefore people cheat and tell them, oh, I got a five, although you got a two. Uh, I really did something uh, similar in which you're supposed to throw a dice in front of a, a, a in front of a person, and uh, 
whatever on top or at the bottom, could be any number from one to six, right? But then it tells you before you throw it, think which monetary incentive you want to get, the one from the bottom or the one from the top. And people, but remember it in your head, don't tell me. And then after they throw the dice, they, they have to tell the person, okay, so were you thinking bottom or up? Usually when you throw a six, you say, yeah, I was thinking up. And when it's a one, you say, no, no, I was thinking the other way around. So, uh, But again, uh, just by being luckier in these studies, unless we put a camera on them, uh, it's going to be hard to detect who they are. So Ariely did, uh, Ariely, obviously Mazar, Amir, and Ariely um, did a study in which, um, a very tricky study in which, uh, it's called the matrix experiment, in which people get matrices of numbers that you have to kind of find numbers that uh, amount to 10. So a three and a seven, a four and a six, and you get lots and lots of numbers and you have to do it fast. And the more, uh, the faster you find these pairs, uh, the more money you get. Um, now, uh, people do it on paper and they, they have to report how many, how many they did. So in this experiment, most people did uh, two more pairs than they actually did. And how do they know? Because they told them at the experiment, after you're gonna give me your, your test, we're gonna shred it. We're gonna shred it and you just have to tell me how many you got. But the shredder was a malfunctioning shredder. So he doesn't make, makes a sound, but he doesn't shred the paper. So they can actually know how many pairs were there. Uh, but again, this is a very tricky design in which you need to have so much technology and knowledge and an office. And when we are all now into a world of, of online surveys, and this is the Roper Center, right? So online surveys, uh, if you have online surveys, how are you going to do it online? And that's what was, I was breaking my, my, banging my head over the wall for the last almost 10 years. How I can get people to cheat without them knowing that I caught them and I'll be knowing that I did it and feel ethical about it to some degree, <laughs> to some degree. Uh, so at first my, my original design or original thought was I'm gonna uh, put cameras in my room, in my office, and I'm gonna have people watch a clip of Netanyahu stealing something. And then I'm gonna play strategically a 20 shekel bill was about 20 shekel would be about uh, seven dollars six seven dollars on the floor if they pick it up and return it to me then the video had no effect if they pick it up and they take it and they leave my office but again it's not feasible then i'll have to measure if they are their height if they could see the the the, the, the money but really complicated uh, effort and the research design that we wanted to do was basically to have people watch a clip in which we have a mayor arrested for bribery, a clip in which the mayor just control, inaugurates a factory of Intel, okay? That will be the, the two stories. And we wanna see if people who watch that clip will actually become, behave more unethically. Now, to this, we wanted to add actually a way to detect unethical behavior. And this acronym busted, this is Patricia Moy at her best. So it was her creation. So behaviors uncovered in simulated text exposing deception. And we wanted to have a two by two design. So we're gonna have a, a story in which uh, there's, a sto there's, a, there's a new story uh, about corruption, a new story about something else. Some people are gonna get money to get answers correctly, some not. So how we came about with this design. The story is as follows. Uh, the way to detect people's unethical behavior is to have them uh, watch a clip, answer a few questions about the clip with one problem that we're telling them, you need to answer the answers correctly to get the, mo the bonus, the money. However, for one of the questions we asked them, there's no information on the clip. The only way you can answer that question is if you go online and Google it, okay? So a subject comes to the, um, uh, to the lab and, or this is actually online, it's even easier. So it's not the lab, it's, it's online. It's an online survey. You get the link, you enter. You're told 
look, you're uh, in an era of multi screens and and people are, are watching on, on multiple screens. We doubt if people can even watch today a newscast without losing their concentration. And this is the purpose of our study. We want to study if you can still concentrate on a newscast, or on a short newscast. So here's what you need to do. Please watch a clip of a newscast for a few minutes, and then we'll ask you 10 questions. If you answer the 10 questions correctly, you're going to get 50 shekels. 50 shekels is a nice sum in Israel. We're talking about close to uh, $17. So it's, um, it's usually these people who answer surveys in Israel get like five shekels. So this is 10 times more. They still get the five shekels, but they would get an extra 50 more for doing it. Um, and uh, it's more than a student's wage per hour, at least in, for just a few minutes. So please follow the, the, the news, answer the questions, and they get to answer the questions. So here's how it looks like. Um, I'll, I muted it on purpose, we'll see it in a second, but this is like more by Moran. This is Moran, my co-author. So Moran is really a, a, a reporter, a TV reporter in Israel. So we got the studio of the first Channel One Israel to do the, this for us for free. It helps to have connections. <laughs> it's not corruption, we asked for it. <laughs> uh, so this is the clip and it says two people die on a car accident. And then we have a mayor arrested for bribery charges. So we see the courtroom. And, um, and this is the charges of a construction. Obviously, most of bribes with politicians are about construction and land, uh, land use. Uh, so that's the second story of the news brief. Um, now, the, the third story is where we make the manipulation of the knowledge. So Prime Minister of Iceland criticizes Trump for not taking a stand for climate change, okay? So it relates to your work. Uh, the only thing is we never say her name. We just say Prime Minister of Iceland. The number of people in Israel who know the name of Prime Minister of Iceland is probably two. <laughs> and it's the, the Icelandic ambassador to Israel and his assistant. Uh, and now we have the weather. So the weather is gonna be like this. And that's it, all right? And people are incentivized to cheat. And why is that? Because whatever you answer, and some of the questions, by the way, are on purpose, open-ended questions, so you, don't, you get used to it. So it's not just like, yes, no. So for instance, what's the color of the jacket of the newscaster? Whatever you write, you write yellow, whatever, good. Keep on going, keep on going. You're eight out of eight. And when you get to nine out of 10, you're asked this question, what's her name? And the funny thing was that people went online, you'll see it, but some of them were very creative. So for instance, they found the name in, a, um, some of them were, were actually <laughs> negligent. They just took the name with all those uh, unusual characters that you have in, in uh, Nordic languages, and they just copied and pasted. There's no way in the, in the keyboard in Hebrew to have those letters, but they wrote it the same. Uh, what? Okay, and and some people, I think it's like you like they would take the name, but they would write in their words. I think it sounds like Jorgen, na, 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 and then they would butcher it a bit just so they so they won't feel as bad as we're cheating. Uh, but uh, but many and many actually use the name. Here you can see, and and actually here how it sounds in the English version. Oh, there's no sound for some reason. Never mind. So this is going to be the. Um, no, this is, I just didn't change the slide, sorry. Here. So this is the version we're gonna run in a few weeks, I hope, in uh, Midwest. So this is news from Omaha, Nebraska, all right? And it's exactly the same clip, the same reporter, the same text, except for a few changes. So there's no Route 90 next to uh, Omaha, Nebraska, but it's mostly the same. Uh, and we're gonna run it in the United States and you'll see why we wanna run it also in, in the US. But, but it's exactly the same, uh, the same story, the same images. 
I think except for the weather, because you have it differently, your, your five-day forecast is a bit different than ours, and you, know, you do it with obviously not metrics, uh, and that's what the change. So here's the first hypothesis, which the, the only hypothesis there is, the rest are research questions. So first of all, we wondered, did the incentive work? Did the money incentive work? And as you can see, about 30% of people that got money to cheat actually cheated. And again, cheated was forbidden. It was, they were told, you are not permitted to go to Google. You're only supposed to do it from your memory because this is a story, this is an experiment about your memory, knowledge, and storage. So uh, it's not as high as, as some studies uh, like, um, like Ariely has, who got to 70%, but it's definitely significant and, and uh, uh, enough people in our study have done it. And, and by the way, there's 100 persons in each, in each group, so 400 respondents. Uh, and this already, you can see that probably the experiment didn't work that well. We'll get to it in a sec. So in terms of our first research question, who are the people who are more likely to cheat? The only person, we were sure it's gonna be the young versus old. Old people are not gonna cheat, young people are gonna do it because they're savvy and they're like, don't care much about uh, ethics. Uh, but no, the only thing that really stands out was voting for right-wing parties. Um, we find it not as surprising because we ran this study uh, as Netanyahu was negotiating whether to get a plea deal uh, with the, the Justice Department or to stand for trial. Uh, if your leader is currently on trial, if your party is currently on trial, if usually the law enforcement in Israel persecutes uh, uh, politicians from the right wing side, then perhaps you're more inclined to say, hey, everybody, my campaign is doing. Or alternatively, if I'm a, I, 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 we can read it in a different manner. If I'm a lefty in Israel, and currently I'm hearing Netanyahu is a cheat, Netanyahu is a cheat, Netanyahu is stalled, Netanyahu is corrupt. The people in government currently is the, it's the right wing is in government at, at that time. So if, am I gonna associate myself with that group? Not very likely, like I'm better than, right? Think of these, the American council. Am I going to be like the Trumpers? No, I'm not, not going to riot. I'm not going to protest. Even if I was defeated, I'm not going to riot, right? Not many uh, left-wingers in 2016 said, I'm going to riot. The election was stolen. Although perhaps it was stolen, but they're not going to riot. When it comes to the experiment itself, unfortunately in Israel, uh, it didn't work. So the exposure to uh, corruption uh, did not get us uh, where we wanted to go, when you expected it to go. Um, and, uh, and we find no main effect uh, there. Now, uh, a few things. So the, uh, the as, as we said, the experiment uh, in what we were hoping for uh, did not work. The potential explanation would be that uh, we are infested by corruption in Israel. Think about it. We are, it's the third most topic talked about during the media in 2019. So this is a content analysis of media uh, conducted in that year. And everybody talks about corruption. If it's not about the election, it's about corruption. And if it's about the election and corruption, it could be the same thing. Um, so therefore, uh, adding, at least that's our gut feeling, adding one more story about corruption to be exposed to during a certain time is not gonna really trigger me to act corruptly. I'm thinking about corruption when I wake up, when I eat lunch and I will go to sleep because it's there all the time. And therefore, just one more story is not going to affect me. Now, uh, that is why uh, we want to extend it to another country. And we thought about the U.S., and especially the U.S. in the Midwest. Because in New York, L.A., with all due respect to those cities, uh, you're more likely, or Florida, 
you're more likely to encounter corruption. And uh, but whenever you're talking to right to people, um, I guess most of you are Americans. If you want decent people, they're in the Midwest, right? <laughs> <laughs> the decent America, like you know, like in New York, you would want like a mattress, right? You buy a mattress in New York, you could have a policy of you have to return it within 24 hours. In the Midwest, if you're in Lincoln, Nebraska, oh, three months, it's okay, three months. I never used it. No, no, we know, we're sure we know you never used it. We're fine. We'll, we'll give that, get that mattress back to you. So we want to try it in the Midwest when there's less corruption than in the big cities and, um, and, and people are supposed to be uh, decent and we want to show it to them there and perhaps there it will have an effect. We don't know, we, we'll have to, to try it out. Um, now, the, obviously there's gonna be used uh, with similar setups, but something that I wanna actually want to get your thoughts on and perhaps promote it is to use the method. So this was used to study corruption, but uh, you could use the same methodology and, and many people here study public opinion uh, instead of being the dependent variable, use it as a, as a control variable. So think about it that you're running some study and you wanna see, for instance, a support for Trump, right? Are people who are more likely to engage in dishonest behavior more likely to vote for Trump or avoid taxes or uh, be in favor of doing nothing for the environment? And um, so that could be many, those could be many, many uses for the same methodology. So this is not a methodology just for corruption. It's a methodology that gets us into some kind of measure of a trait of human behavior, likelihood to engage in, in, a, in corruption. And the nice thing is that it does cost a bit of money. So, and by the way, to be ethical, because you couldn't get a, the correct response a, by not cheating. So all our respondents got 50 shekels, regardless if they succeed or not. So eventually they got a link and they said, because you participated, thank you so much. 50 shekels, still thank you for your efforts. Uh, so it does bear a cost, but if you're, especially if you're using a panel and, and the panel is kind of constant and you can use it again and again, and again, you can use it as a, as a constant trait that, that, uh, that you know about individuals, just like you know their age or you know their, perhaps their big five. So those things are, are very useful. Um, all right, I'll stop here and I'll welcome your comments, suggestions. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, please. So, two questions. Yeah. One is a clarification question. This is, if I understand correctly, you're trying to measure the degree susceptibility of corruption in a population. Is that what you were trying to accomplish? Well, not the, not the ability, but uh, we're trying uh, to see if, um, yeah, if a certain individual is more likely or not to behave unethically, yes. But again, this started not as a, as a study of a measure. We kind of invented the measure to try and study corruption. On the way, we came up with this methodology uh, that can be useful for uh, detecting other behaviors or related to other behaviors, but, but yes. Okay. Then, I mean, if you are trying to measure this, is, uh, I don't know if this particular incentive is the right one to get a good degree of how likely it is that someone will be tempted to corrupt or not. Sometimes, as you mentioned before, there is a degree of what is susceptible within a society and that, uh, let's say in your, uh, in your case, who is the person that is, uh, has the highest degree of uh, relation to you? You're, if that person to you is more likely to do something unethical, you're more likely to feel the same way. Right. So when I look at the example that you were given with this image, uh, of a town, 
a normal town, perhaps any town, unless they knew the person or they knew the, the community within it, they don't feel anything. So I would imagine, just I, I, I guess, that the degree in which they will feel because of seeing that, we much less compared to if it's not someone they recognize or someone that they feel in relation to, in relation to like almost like, for example, something out of the norm, like a mother or, or some figure, like a fireman or something that is something they can experience daily. Right, you're, you're right. So, so the problem was in Israel, we, we, we thought about it uh, in, in our design. So at first we said, why not just use Netanyahu or one of the politicians we know to be the person, but then you have a party ID or, or identification playing along. And then we said, okay, so who's gonna, who's gonna be that, this person? So mayors in Israel, for the most part, are nonpartisan. So it's not like here you're running on a ticket. So usually the names of the parties for mayor, they are disconnected from their national party. You could run as a Likud kind of guy for Jerusalem. But in most of the towns, you run, let's say, for uh, my Haifa, our Haifa, the Haifa for everybody. Okay. Uh, so usually if you're a racist, it's my Haifa or our Haifa, if you don't want the Arabs to be there. So we had many of those parties, but it's everybody's Haifa, then everybody's. Haifa. So, so you, you, at least you disconnect that. Obviously, if, and by the way, and, and we invented this, this uh, vice mayor, it's not a real person. Uh, it's a small town in the, in the south of Israel. The likelihood of somebody even knowing that name is, is I, I don't know who's the vice mayor of my own town. And I'm a political scientist. Uh, we, it's, it's a, it's a non-function. It doesn't serve any function. Uh, we, on purpose, we didn't use the mayor. It was the, the vice mayor of, of, of this little town. Uh, obviously, if it's going to be somebody who I care about, or somebody who's even prox in proximity to me, definitely that should be a, a, more likely there's going to be a contagious effect to it. So now, uh, I was telling John, we're, we're going to go with Moran um, uh, to Argentina. And we're going to do uh, experiments in which we do it at the, uh, there's a place in, in Argentina, you can pay, uh, you accumulate fines, but you don't pay because inflation is, it's not worthwhile to pay them. So you pay them like once a year and we're going to uh, go to those places in which you fight for your fines and, and it's, it's South America. So you can negotiate, okay? You can get a better deal. So you negotiate with the magistrates who's supposed to fine you and it, you bring them 12 vines and say, you know, only six, seven, eight. But there are people there that are like, um, I forgot the, the Spanish name. Um, it get back to me. But there's people there that you can actually uh, come approach you as you sit in, the, in line and they tell you, do you want me to help you with this? So we actually are gonna, we plan on doing an experiment in which with the justice department, obviously, in which we're going to bring a, a, two actors. Uh, so there's going to be a, an actresses. She's going to sit as if she's a victim of those fines as well. And somebody, a male person is going to approach her. They're usually males. He's going to approach her and says, do you want me to pay the fines? And she's going to say yes. And the person next to her is our experiment. So we want to see if he's going to be contagious. If there's going to be a contagious effect from her. So this is a person who seems nice, close to you physically. And uh, you don't know, but she agreed to do the bribery thing. So if the bribery is done by a person who's nice, decent next to you, there's more likelihood that you're gonna do it. We're gonna compare it obviously to people who are, we are gonna approach directly and say, do you want us to pay for you the fine and compare how that helps. I hope that it's a long answer to your question, but I, I hope that that will encapsulate some of the proximity on, on, on the corruption a component, right? Thank you. I kind of thought about doing the same thing backwards, though, to see if, like, if watching somebody gets in trouble for the thing will stop them from then. Perfect. Yes. So uh, we already have two more videos, the same video in which he's acquitted, and in which he is, so this is uh, arrested. Uh, acquitted and convicted. So we have this, the same thing, that's the only difference. So we're gonna run those as well. And we're gonna see if actually it's a deterrence. So 
here it was just arrested. So perhaps it's gonna get free. But in the next experiment, we're gonna know if he's actually the, the arrest or the acquittal it says, well, if people can get acquitted from this, I may give it a shot. So. I was wondering if for the American part of it, you might wanna widen it a little bit because you're talking about presumably Nebraska or somewhere like that, you perhaps the less of for corruption, but you mentioned Lagoya. I think at one point, four of the last five governors of Illinois were in jail at the same time. I think that's true. That's Israel or Illinois. Well, that's <laughs> Ian run one in Illinois. Oh, that's a good for a comparison. Now, oh, that's a good. Ian McKay have a corrupt place and a presumably less corrupt place in the same country. Oh, that's that's easier. that's a very smart that's a very smart design. Yes, thank you. Yes, I have dubbed that. Uh, so Illinois, you say? <laughs> okay. Uh, so it even be Midwest. You get rid of the coastal part and allegedly be part of the Midwest, but uh, right. Quite as straight as other. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I was really impressed by the professional quality of those news clips. Maybe you, you guys just like, yeah. great, great design. Um, so I had a question about your political finding in your regression. So voting for right wing parties, you know, that is one of the most significant predictors of corruption. Mm. And then something you mentioned, it made me think that there's, you know, you kind of said there's kind of two hypotheses there, right? Like one, one presumably is that there's something about being, you know, more right wing that would lead, you know, almost like a personality trait or something, something ideological that would lead you to be more accepting of corruption. But then you mentioned, or it could be a context effect, right? Where, well, right wing politicians are very prominently associated with corruption in Israel. And so maybe it's like left wing people sort of almost like an affective polarization effect, right? Like I'm not going to be corrupt because it's those right wingers that are corrupt. Right. And so I guess I just wondered about, do you think you could ever flip that effect? Like if you could find a context in which it's a prominent left wing person who's been corrupt, could you ever get it to go the other way or what? Yes. The only problem is that currently we are, this, this trial is going to last for at least three to four more years. Uh, and Netanyahu is very much associated as, as a one-sided person. Uh, the, the people I mentioned before, so one of them is an orthodox, ultra-orthodox party who is neither right or left, is just uh, takes care of his own people. Uh, the other person who was indicted, the other prime minister, Olmert, Olmert was a lefty. He's the one that was uh, in charge of getting the negotiations in 2009, and he says he's going to bring is going to return 95% a, a of the territories for a peace accord. So although he started with the Likud, but he shifted to, to the left. Uh, unfortunately, that most people don't, don't have that memory and we cannot do like a, I cannot bring them to that, the, that environment. Uh, the only way I could think of, of flipping it would be if I can do it in a municipality in which find a, a corrupt politician from a lefty. But but you'll have to sample just that municipality in that event. But I sh I don't see why at least to see if it's a trait or if it's like my camp versus their camp. Right. I'm gonna go down. I go high when they go low. So uh, if that's the mentality, then it should work the same for. And again, the the research uh, you know this book uh, by um, the, the the weird people. There's this social psychology about the. But educated, uh, industrialized, that weird, like that. Yeah, 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 the, the WASP, right. So in, in that book, it, it details many cases of, of, of preferential treatment, and the preferential treatment has no political thing. It has a caste thing. It's solely about caste, helping your caste. So the caste can be from this ethnicity or the other ethnicity, or just helping your group. And if you're helping your group, uh, and then your group, by the way, could be putting food on your kid's table or paying whatever beers for the guys tonight at, at the party, uh, it should work uh, regardless. But again, because it's a, again, we, we are operating within a very right. unique system in which whenever you think corruption in Israel today, you're thinking Netanyahu, even if you think he's, 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 uh, he should be acquitted, even if you're thinking you think you're acquitted, because it's, it's just a topic of the day. Yes, and it's also, I think, duration. I mean, he's been in power for a long time. And so it's been the one person who's corrupt potentially now but in like Latin America where there's a little bit more changeover, you might be able to find 
some differences too. I have a question about. And in Argentina and other Latin American countries, you're right. They, there's also corruption from the left. Okay, people think about, for instance, in Argentina, Evita. So Evita, people love this. Right, it's a great musical, whatever. But uh, but uh, uh, people think about Evita and Evita. How did she become so uh, lovable? And she was from. Uh, Peron was very unique because he was a military dictator, but he was also the, the leader of the labor the labor uh, um, office because he knew the power comes from unions and from the military. And she would go to, for instance, to the Zenith company. Zenith was a huge trans, trans, transistor company at the time. And he, she, he would go, she would go to Zenith and say, I want you to donate to the people 10,000 transmitters, tra transistors. And she would, they would say, no. Oh, that's unfortunate because I think I saw mice here in your factory and we have to call, close it. Here are 10,000 transistors. And she would go to the favelas of, it's, that's, the, the, that's the Brazilian name, but, but the, the slums of the Vichas of, of Buenos Aires. And she would go with these transistors. And this is from the government in Peron. Okay. So that's how it worked. So corruption can come from the left easily, easily. Uh, and then, um, so you, yeah, so you need these methods to like elicit that or like controls. There's so many controls that you need to have in this study. But I have a really basic question because I remember being in grad school and, and dealing with informed consent. And like, so to his point about comp, uh, compensation, sure, if you gave them 100 or thousand dollars, more people might be inclined to be uh, unethical. But like, at least here, when I did my study, it was like, you have to tell people what you're going to do, with, including that they will get compensation at the very beginning. So they sign on. It's like, how do you, how do you ethically kind of tell them that they'll be, that they will get a reward of some sort, but also keep them blind to it? You know what I mean? I just think that's a general, like, good methodology question. Well, we didn't tell them that they're going to be compensated as much. We told them, it's like, if you remember everything, you're going to get your 50 shekels. If you don't remember everything, you're just going to get money for your participation, okay. which everybody knew they're going to get. That's the, the panel company. That's what they pay them. They pay them like in, a, a, in vouchers for shops or so like you get like gift cards. So you're going to get your gift card for participation in the study, but you're going to get so much more from the researchers if you do this. Right. And obviously at the end of the study, there was a debriefing telling them, look, we, this was for the purpose of this. Please don't share it with anybody because this is an ongoing study. Because uh, perhaps they have friends that are doing the uh, the study. But uh, but I'll tell you that's one of the least problematic studies that that we've done in the last couple of years in terms of IRBs. But but again, if you're if you're if you're very coming up front to the IRB committee and you're telling them exactly what you're going to do, the the motivation behind it again, we're not going after anybody. Like in most of these studies. Like, uh, like Ariely, and I'm not going to talk about his ethics lately, he's been in the news, but um, if you're doing it again, if, if, if I'm trying to do something here that perhaps will help each state get 22% of the GDP back to the people where it belongs, then there's a reason why we do it. We're not doing it just for fun. Uh, I, think, I think that's, uh, or perhaps the, the next uh, step would be if these people, what I care about is, would they be more or less willing to vote in the future? Which is really what I care most about in my work, uh, access to voting and being able to vote. If people are so disengaged because of what happens with corruption um, and they're part of it, and even perhaps being part of it, you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm part of the problem. I'm not part of the solution anymore, uh, ethically. Um, Yes, but I guess most, most Israelis would, to some degree, have at one point or another, including myself, a repairman comes and says, do you need a receipt? No, I don't need a receipt, which means 17% off of whatever you're, you're doing. Your plumber comes. I don't think plumbers in Israel know what a receipt is. <laughs> they, it doesn't exist. Um, so... See, like if, you, if you're in a context that it's so ubiquitous that you know it's just a means to an end corruption in a political system where it's just so prevalent that like the perception would be oh this is just how it works and then maybe that would mean people are more willing to vote because it's just part of the, it's one of the cogs in the machine it's not that like 
I feel like here we'd be a little less inclined to vote because we feel disenfranchised because we can't control that corruption. But maybe you're so steeped in corruption in some places that it's right. like, you know what, you still have to vote. You just like swallow it. You swallow it. Right, but you swallow it, but you still you still feel antagonized. Like I know from, from uh, friends in uh, my relative, I still have family in Argentina. And for instance, um, uh, you go to renew your uh, passport, let's say, and you're actually running out of time because you bought tickets and you, you may not make it. And the lady there tells you, well, you know, it's too bad. You're not going to make the, 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 make it on time. But then you bring 10 Marlboros and she goes, you're done. And that's it. Or uh, my, my cousin, who's an accountant, usually is like straight as, a, as, a, as, a, as a they go. Uh, his son got anxiety from taking the driver's test. He's now, last year he turned 18. He, he took the exam. He was studying for, for a year to drive because you have to take lessons. It's not like here you can drive with your parents or something. You have to take official lessons. He took the lessons, but when he came to the exam, he froze. My, my cousin, what he did at the time to help his kid, what's very common, he gave 40 bucks. 40 US dollars to the test person. And he said, oh, he drove amazingly. And he gave him the permit. Mm -hmm. So it's, but everybody, it's, it's always there. Actually is, is the most, that's actually more decent. Most people just pay a bit more and get rid of the, the lessons themselves. You just get the permit even without taking the lessons. So I think it does something to us. This corruption really gets into your soul. And, 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 and then when you think of, Everybody, uh, when in Argentina, when there was the crisis of 2003, I believe, the slogan was, que se vayan todos, let everybody go. Because the assumption is that all of them are corrupt. All of them are part of the system, left and right. We need people that are new. I think it was Hector Chamis who did a paper on it. Uh, he was here at that time at Cornell. And he said, what do you mean? Who's going to be the politicians? If all of them are corrupt, you need new blood. But who's going to be, it's not like we're in ancient Greece in which we can draw straws and or, or pieces of, of uh, ceramics and, and then tell people, okay, you're the clean ones, go in. And... So, um, I'm just curious, like, because you were mentioning there's a two different types of corruption, like the ground corruption and the city corruption. One thing I found is interesting, like the video you're showing is about a ground corruption, right, about a mayor. But the experiment you're conducting is more like a city corruption. Right. Have you tried to, instead of using a, like official news, you put in, like a short video on TikTok or like a, a page on like Twitter and they're talking about all the things like, oh, the, the register, the target is busted, they're gonna hand, they're, you can get a free TV and right. that kind of thing. And we're just, like to ask if people actually will behave differently because I personally feel like sometimes you watch those like corrupt politicians for people in younger generation, unless they pay attention to politics, they will feel like disconnected. It's just another background noise and your parents put out on the standing table. Or like if you're actually scrolling TikTok every day, oh, that's a, like a lot of my younger friends, like that's how they send me this way, right. how they send the information. Can you consider like using the example of pity corruption to test people's response on the media about their pity corruption? That's a good point. We didn't think about it in terms of using it in media. Uh, the experiment we're playing in Buenos Aires, that's, but that's the thing. The thing is that the person next to you is doing petty corruption. Mm -hmm. He's not like this politician. It's just Jane Doe next to you or whatever. And, and, and she's doing the petty corruption herself. She looks decent. She looks young, innocent. Uh, and, and we want to see if that kind of transfers if you because i assume that if you hear that like you're renovating your house uh, sorry to this morning i saw a gtv for like <laughs> i it was 2 a.m and i couldn't see i'm jet lagged so you can see it without words right so uh, uh so you see your your neighbor re renovating and you ask her huh so these painters they're renovating your yeah but i got a deal i got a special deal with them okay and you so uh, tell me what's the deal so I want, I want in on that deal because it's a good deal. If it's going to save you $10,000 on the new whatever porch you're doing, then you want part, to be part of the deal. So I think there's, there's a lot to it. And I think that it, maybe it even affects us more than, than the politicians. Because as you say, the politicians are out there, but this is Jeannie, my best friend, 
and Jeannie is currently not paying the taxes on her Uber, whatever, she's doing it privately. She has a thing with the Uber driver she knows and he comes by and she doesn't use the application, she just pays cash and it's cheaper. I never used Uber, but I suspect that. Um, so, so, you, so I think you're, you're onto something that's, that's quite significant. Also, can I ask one more question? Sure. I was also curious why we were talking about the vote on the grant question. I was curious, like, because of like how diverse, uh, how like polarized the media is, would be possible to run, uh, like, see people's results when you run news, see if you pre survey, like, which party or which wing they're on, and you run the crop, like, a Democrat news and to the Republican what runs crop Democrat news to Democrat voters and also do the West Wurzel, would do you think there'll be a difference in terms of the survey on that? Well, again, if you do it for, for Trump or Hillary or something, then people are just going to believe whatever you see. So it's, it's Fox News and you're a Watts, Watts Fox News uh, watcher, you, whatever you're going to see there, you're going to assume that's right. Uh, I suspect that if, if Fox News is going to say that Trump is corrupt or something like that. It's going to be a it's going to be a, 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 a cognitive dissonance thing that in which you won't be able to even function. <laughs> uh, like uh, there's one right. There was one uh, uh, Wallace was supposed to be in Fox to keep them straight, and he's no longer in Fox. Uh, and I suspect that also for MSNBC, if you're going to be somebody there next to Rachel Meadows, is going to say. Hillary is corrupt. It's it's just gonna you know, something wrong with my control remote or like my TV is broken. Uh, you could do it for lower level elections, I, I suspect, and that would work better. Like if you see the mayor of New Fork and it's Fox News local, it may prime you, but Fox News local is not Fox News, right? So, and 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 I suspect that Fox News. National won't cover a small corruption deal that happens in a locality in which you don't know the politician. Again, you cannot do it with Mario Cuomo. You cannot do it with, with people who you know because then it doesn't work. All your political ID goes into play there. You want to clean it just from the, the, the broadcaster. So in Israel, we did it with Channel One. Channel One is supposed to be like the NPR, but not NPR in is the the NPR, in terms of quality reporting, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a, a left or right uh, bias at all. Uh, it's not sensational. That's the meaning. It's like the BBC in Israel. So that's why we use uh, Channel One. Um, yeah, and, and that's the reason also in, in Nebraska or whatever, Oma, we, we did, like, this is the local affiliate or whatever. Nobody's going to feel bad about it or one way or the other. And obviously, we won't show it in... It's not going to be shown in Omaha, Nebraska. It's going to be shown in the surroundings. So it's going to be perhaps in Kansas, in, in, uh, in uh, Oklahoma, but not definitely not in, in Nebraska. So people say, hey, I don't know that. I should have heard about this or so to avoid any problems. Well, I think we're at time. So we should probably leave it there. Thanks so much, Israel, for a fascinating talk. Really good to have you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And if you do have questions or remarks, feel free to either contact me now or email. I'd be happy to. Great.